Number 214, 214. I will enter the kingdom with thanksgiving in my heart. Oh 
hot. Oh, oh, beautiful. Oh, cold. Perfect. <laughs> no? It's oh, a little warm okay. inside, but outside is nice. So, oh, what a beautiful day. Beautiful, beautiful day. All right. We're going to continue our study tonight in, uh, in the book of Proverbs. We're going to continue looking at the importance of a biblical education. Bill Lemieux was here and had to go on a call. So sorry to miss him. Men's breakfast tomorrow. So we make it down at the wayside. It's at 8 o'clock. And I'm sure uh, that'll be a blessing. We had a really good Friday night um, with the uh, Legacy of Leadership Banquet. Uh, they had set up for about 175, so it was pretty full. I mean, it was pretty full. Uh, I thought everything went pretty well overall. And, um, and so we really were glad to honor uh, three of our educators, our four of our educators who have uh, gave so diligently, have given so diligently to, uh, to the school here. Don't forget this Sunday, we have his songs. Okay, so they'll be with us this Sunday. And uh, then we have potluck right after. And uh, from last I talked to Mel, uh, we'll be providing uh, some barbecue chicken. That people can bring uh, vegetables, desserts. That would be a real blessing. Okay. So, all right. All right. So Proverbs. Uh, let's go to Proverbs chapter number seven. Actually, uh, that's where we're going to look. We, really, when it comes down to the importance of a biblical education, it could be. Uh, as much as what is the difference between life and death. That's how important it can be. And that there's probably no other chapter that will bring that out like Proverbs 7. And it's one thing to, obviously it's one thing to have the education, it's another thing to adhere to that education. But people can't adhere to what they don't know. So that's kind of the premise of where we're going with this today. So you recall that we, last time we were together, Proverbs 3, 1 and 2 starts off this way. My son, forget not my law, but let thine ear keep, or heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. And then we notice that it's almost uh, this synonymous, it's almost uh, identical when we go to Proverbs 7, 1. Where it says, my son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. My law is the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the tables of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. So again, we see this very important part of... Don't leave you out. <laughs> of this aspect of the importance of the word of God. Um, Tragedy, tragedy is going to strike no matter what. Life is going to have its, its obstacles no matter what. But I'd rather have the guidance of the Word of God when going through it than not have it. And uh, we are kind of sensitive to, the, to today because there's been a lot of tragedy up in our, our last neck of the woods up near Newport. Uh, for whatever reason, there's, there's been... Uh, there's been some suicides, there's been some murders, there's been, uh, you know, this is like a small community and you're just, you know a lot of these people. In fact, uh, the news today coming out of Orleans, uh, their kids went to school with our kids in the high school. And you begin to just say, wow, wow, what's going on? And the fact is that, you know, we have a reality here that by at least abiding by the word of God, a lot of that tragedy that they're facing up north could have been avoided. A lot of it could have been avoided. And so we have here then, thus we see the benefit of such an education, and especially there must be adherence to it. Proverbs 7, 5 then says, that they keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger flattereth with her words. And what I really would like to just note here, what I really like to note is that we really have two courses of instruction. We have the one that comes from God, from the Word of God, and then we have this other that is going to be metaphorically presented, the strange woman. And she's going to be representative uh, of, a, of a system, of a, 
a series of teachings and belief that really, in, in essence, we're going to see as we go down through here, is really contrary to the, the word of wisdom that's coming forth by the, word, by the words of Solomon, which obviously were inspired by God himself. You might have heard me uh, say this before, and it's worthy to note that this book is written by Solomon, King Solomon, noted to be the wisest. And we could do a little story about that and note, it, note that you know, we have this idea of him being the wisest, and he's giving counsel to his son, which could have and probably was Rehoboam. And we know that Rehoboam doesn't adhere quite to the wisdom of Solomon, and, and as a result, the nation of Israel is divided into two, two, two kingdoms, the northern tribes and the southern tribes, ten to the north and two to the south. But we also note that part of that contributor was that Solomon did not live wisely all his days. He started well, but Solomon didn't finish well. Solomon had influence upon his life. And how ironic that he talks about a strange woman here. And we note that, that when he, you know, not to, not to get in, we, we joke about it, but you just, it's mind-boggling to have 700 wives and 300 concubines. That is, oh. There's nothing wise about any of that, right? And then contribute the fact that he, he, his marriage was not within the realms of, of the spiritual realm. He was unequally yoked. He marries his, for his first bride is, is, is out of Egypt. And then as time goes on, the brides became from other pagan backgrounds. And these brides began to want to worship their gods. They didn't want to worship Solomon's god. And so he, he, was, he felt, I guess, compelled to, to raise up temples and worship places for his wives. And the Bible says that when we get down to the end of Solomon's reign, God was angry with him. Because his heart had been turned because of these influences. Strange women, as it were. How ironic. How ironic. And so when we kind of read the book of Ecclesiastes, in a way I feel like that's his repentance letter. It's like, I did all kinds of stuff and I found it to be pretty vain. Pretty vexing of spirit. The conclusion of the whole matter? Fear God and keep his commandments. How simple. You know, and yet we have this, this dynamic now that's going to exist between what God says from Solomon out of chapter 7 and this concept of this strange woman. There remains an alternative message in contrast to God's. We know that to be a fact. If ever there's a time in U.S. history that it's more prevalent to have two, two pathways of messages going on, it's probably right now. You have the truth of what comes, and then we have this, these lies and these fake news issues and these other things that are very secular that go contrary to the thinking of God from the Bible. And we're living in that day, and that's a vexation to us. But God's word is true, and it can continue to be relied upon. So the only way to keep or guard myself and others from such contrary advice, which is so prevalent especially with the movement of, and I know we hit on this, and I'm not, I'm not really saying I'm against it. I'm just simply saying we've got to be aware of the social media and the amount of information that comes piling through at very fast rates through Facebook, through Twitter, through some of those others. I, I can tell you it's, it's even mind-boggling to, to turn on the news, and if, if you listen to a more conservative station, they'll be talking, for instance, let's just say... Uh, um, Let's just put it out like Israel, you know, and and yet they'll be one will be pro Israel, then the other's gonna be pro Hamas right now, right? That whole scenario going on. And you're like, well, what is it? What is the truth? And you have some well, I don't care what side of the fence you are on Trump, but it doesn't matter because it's obvious that some are pro and some are against. And it depends on who you're listening to that you get all this stuff. And you're like, I don't even want to pay attention to anything now. It doesn't make sense. And so here's where, here's what sets the footing, here's what sets the footing then when people start to do what's right in their own eyes. You can't trust this source, you can't trust that source, then the only one I can trust is myself. And now we have that other dynamic that starts to come forth, and we, people did what's right in their own eyes and created a lot of spiritual bondage as well as physical bondage. And so here we go, let's just note right off the simple ones. 
And the simple ones we're going to read about here from chapter 7, verse 6. It says, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. The simple ones, we see this, first time we see the word simple is in chapter number 1. The simple here, even by our definition, is used from our scripture. It says, those void of understanding. They are in need of being educated. These could have been the dropouts. I don't know. But they're in a group. And by the way, they're young. They're youthful. Indicating that just from that alone, who are the ones that we really have to concentrate our education on? The youth. And it's because they're simple. And that doesn't mean that that's a derogatory term. It means that they're void of understanding. And the kind of understanding we're talking about is from Proverbs chapter number 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or knowledge, or knowledge in chapter 1, verse 7. And in chapter 9, verse 10, it's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the holy is understanding. Okay? And now we see where that understanding that is being alluded to. Having that knowledge of the holy brings that kind of understanding. But to have that kind of knowledge, I have to have first the fear of the Lord. Guess what's not happening in a lot of our institutions? And I'm not just talking schools. I'm talking about our homes sometimes. The whole principle of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge is missed a lot of places in our society and in our culture today. Mm -hmm. Thus... The conclusion is this. Why do they do that? It's driving me crazy. They're so foolish. Exactly. They have no understanding. And so that's what this idea of simple ones are in need of educated. And by the way, they will go where it goes. They will absorb it like, like a, a sponge. And notice how, how it entices some. And so now we get into it's not always about the music. It's not always about social media. It's about the fact that we have young people who follow, it's like, if I could use this, they follow their nose. Like a beagle. Anybody ever raised beagles? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Those dogs are cute, but they're just going to follow one thing. They're going to follow the scent wherever it goes. And so that's kind of the idea that's coming out of here. And so in Proverbs 6, er, so we need to note that they're youthful. We know that they're among the simple ones. So this, and by the way, isn't that interesting that you can tell, you, you heard the old cliche, and there's some truth to it. The truth being, birds of, birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. There's a reason, even in our schools, that certain groups migrate together because of common interest. In this case, we see the common interest is they're all simple. They all need understanding. Now, he says, and they went, and then it says they went to a pathway that leads to darkness. And so we're going to talk about that in just a moment, a little bit more. And notice this darkness, where, it, where it's going to go. So if you drop down, it says, notice it says the movement from light to darkness. Boy, this, that's what's so beautiful about the poetic books. They really build word pictures by this, this transgression, that are this, this trans, this not transgression, but the way that they're trans transporting through this. So notice the way that verse 9 sets up here. It says, in the twilight, in the evening, in the dark, a black and dark night. You see then this progression from light to very dark night. So we're going we're gonna to assume he's starting in a place of some dimness, but still some light. He can go towards the light, or he can go darkness. Do you get the picture? He's going towards darkness. That's where he's going. And so it says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot, subtle of heart. Where, does, where is she at? She's in the darkness. She is this strange woman. He, in his simple ways, and that could be any of us, decided out of pleasure, following our nose, out of desires of our flesh, to follow something that leads to something that looks like, hey, this is going to be okay. This is going to be fun. And yet, we know sin is but for a season, right? 
And when that happens, notice what happens here. So we have this, this parallel. Now I've read into this, but notice this strange woman, we're told. From verse 10, it says that she was, <clears throat> there met him a woman with an attire of a harlot and subtle heart. And notice in verse 11, she is loud and stubborn and her feet abide not in her house. Now I didn't, I didn't write that verse in there, but there's this parallel. The Bible tells us she's loud. She's stubborn, and her feet abide not in her house. So I, I write down under strange woman, loud and stubborn. And then I say, okay, if, if we're seeing this contrast, she's a picture of being in darkness and sin, what is the opposite? What would be wisdom? Well, this, what we're looking at then, the wisdom here would have been, if he'd gone the other direction, he would have found quietness, and he would have found how to be humble and submissive. Notice she doesn't abide in her house. Notice on the other side, notice on the other side, we would assume that those that are wise would abide in their house. By the way, this is, if, for those of you who, uh, you, you know, in this room, probably not too many except myself, maybe Tim here, but as we start to raise children, uh, uh, obviously also uh, Jan, as we raise children, this is a good, this is a good, um, a good way to kind of watch out for your kids how to instruct them on how to find a good spouse because notice specifically it's saying about a woman well there's something to be said about her dress the way she dresses there's something to be say, said about whether she's quiet or whether she's loud there's something to be said about does she does she go out and, and spend a lot of time out or does she stay kind of to her home a little bit there's something to be said about uh, the way that she approaches a young man. So it says even in our scriptures, and I didn't write them all down for space sake, but I'll read it to you. It says, she caught him and kissed him with an impudent face, said unto him, I have peace offerings with me this day. Have I paid my vows? Therefore come, I came I forth to meet thee, diligent to seek thy face, and I found thee. I have decked my bed in coverings of pastry, ta tapestry. And it goes into this idea of seductive, flirtatious. And so what does that tell me? If I have sons and I have a young lady like that, the bells and whistles are going off. You get what I'm saying? And I'd be taking that son over and say, you know what? I wouldn't, I would be real cautious in this one. And it also goes to what we should be looking for in, in raising of our, la our ladies. What should be there? And so we kind of work in that area. But that's not the focus of what I'm talking about. I'm just saying it's interesting that you can make these comparisons, especially for the book of Proverbs. You can make this, you can just line things up and say, well, this is what darkness looks like. This is what light would look like. It's the opposite, right? And so we're here then in verse number 21. It says, with her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. And with flattering of her lips, she forced him. Now, we, this is a really good text, guys, if you're counseling other guys that are having some trouble in certain areas, to sit down and say, you know, there comes a place of no return. Why go there? There's a place of no return. Why go there? All right? The best place to be is in the light, not in the darkness, not in the hiding of such things. And so he says he goes straightway after her, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stocks. And notice here then number two, the movement from light to darkness, but then we have the movement from darkness to death. Chapter 7, verse 23 says, Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasted to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. So we see from the first verse, now even down to verse 23, why is a biblical education important? It could be the difference between life and death. It could honestly be the difference between life and death. And so, in conclusion, we can note here, Proverbs 7.24 says, Hearken unto me now, therefore, O you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Biblical education. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray into her paths. Now, you don't have a lot of time here, but we could take, you could take and go through chapter 2 of the book of Proverbs and just follow the word path or follow the word way. 
and you're going to see it shows up almost a dozen times from chapter 2 and then a couple times into chapter 3. We are basically just talking which way to go. And the one leads to light, and the one leads to darkness. The one leads to life, and the other leads to death. The importance of a biblical education has everything to say and has everything sometimes to do with the distinct, uh, with the significance of the difference between the possibilities of life and death. And then notice Proverbs chapter 7, verse 26. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. The importance of a biblical education. And so when God gave Websterville, I'm talking now the community, a church 110 years ago, it gave them the possibility of a biblical education. And they rose up, the people rose up, and that's why 110 years later, we're still putting forth a biblical education. It comes from these halls. It comes from the, the, the bringing forth of that book. It comes from the work of the Holy Spirit, and it's administered to every one of us that sit in these chairs or are under its teaching, and guess what we do with it? We go home and we apply it. And we have devotional time, and we're in it, and we're being instructed, and we do just what we're told about the idea of when we sit down, we talk about it. We have it planted in our house sometimes. It's wherever we go, that it's <laughs> even in our mind, and it's on our heart. Wherever we go, the Word of God is an opportunity. And we sit down with our children, and we try our best to convey it to them. And you've heard me say, there is no, there is no special combination here. There's no way that I can arm twist my children into saying, follow the Lord. My job is to lay the groundwork to say this is the way to go. Just like Solomon does to Rehoboam. He says that's the way to go. The problem is just like with Solomon. If he doesn't live it, it's going to create problems for the children, isn't it? But even at that, the child can make, make his, his, own, his or her own choice. And they can choose not to. There is no perfect scenario. It's about the heart. It's about a decision. And you know, I don't. And, and I've often found it. We, I've, I've been around families that have, there's absolutely phenomenal families. They're church going. They devout, and for whatever reason, their children just don't want to follow the Lord. Nothing I can do about it. I don't know what to do about it. But I also know families where they they were God honoring, but they sure weren't devout. They sure weren't saved. And you have individuals come right out of that, and they go on and to, to do all kinds of amazing things in ministry and other things. So it's, it's about the heart. But the question really at the core of this is, what will they listen to? Who will they listen to? And how will they go? Okay? So that's, that's where we're going here with this idea of biblical education. So with that in mind, um, we also have a school. 40 years ago, over 40 years ago, a school was, God gave Websterville the responsibility of a school. And as a result of that, we have seen hundreds come uh, through and graduate, thousands have come through our halls and have gone out into the world in all kinds of capacities. And I wish I could say 100% of them have gone on to follow the Lord. No, it didn't happen. But 100% of them that came through these halls had the opportunity to follow the Lord. 100% of those that came through these halls had been given a, a, a way to look at possibility of following the Lord. And that also is true of every one of the families that have been here and have gone home and have taught their children what to do. They have all had the opportunity. And there's still opportunity. The Bible says train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's not old, what? He should not depart from it. There's still opportunity. And why we have breath to breathe, there's still opportunity. There's still opportunity. While we have opportunity to pray, we still have opportunity to bring a biblical education. And you heard the Bible talk about in Deuteronomy that we are to teach our sons and our sons' sons. That's multi-generational. That's not just I'm te planning to teach my son and my daughters and I'm done. No, I'm planning for opportunities to teach my grandchildren if God will even my great-grandchildren. It says in Hebrews that Abraham dwelt in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Now, when we read the account in Genesis, you've heard me say, um, we don't we don't even see Abraham involved in Jacob's life. We don't even know that he's there until you read that one verse in Hebrews and says, wait a minute, Abraham was there. 
with Jacob. What an influence. What an influence. That being said, we have tremendous opportunities set before us. And uh, it's not an easy road here in Vermont. No, nobody's saying it is, but it's a great opportunity. Great opportunity. Uh, this morning, Bill had the opportunity to go, uh, go be on the light uh, radio uh, with Heather Shepherd or Heather, is it Heather Shepherd? Yeah. And, uh, and I thought it was a fantastic, fantastic interview. It took about 10 minutes, but I mean, you could not, I don't think you could have hit Christian education any better than what Bill was saying and, what, and the way Heather was asking questions. I mean, Heather was just really giving good, solid questions about that. And so it was really good to be able to come up to school. And I know that I don't want to also get too, too off-sided. It may sound like I'm getting off track. I'm not. Let me just try to clarify. If God's leading someone to public education, by all means, you've got to do what God says. If someone leads the family to homeschool, you've got to do what God says. I'm just simply saying that I think there's a lot of people out there who can't homeschool and they're not satisfied with what's happening in their public school. And I'm saying there is another safe alternative. Mm -hmm. There is another possibility. And uh, come talk to us and let's see if we can get that worked out. Okay. And so that's what I'm saying. And that, um, that we can try to do our best in that realm. Because I know there's a lot of people in public education working really just working very hard to try to bring a good solid education and be honest with you it's not them <laughs> it's, it's the system is sick the system is just not propped up on its right foundations and it's always going to tilter in the wrong directions and you might prop it up one way and it'll just start going the other direction it's just not had it doesn't have a good biblical education foundation okay <clears throat> and as a result as uh, our speaker on uh, Friday night was pointing out you have a lot of humanism coming in, and humanism is just full of holes. It's just full of holes all the time. All right, it's a basically an idea of do what's right in your own eyes concept. Okay. So let's keep that. Uh, let's keep our school in prayer as we continue to look to enrollment, and uh, and as we continue to move ahead. Uh, Barry, something we've been praying about, and I have some other things to pursue, and I want to make that a, a, a prayer request tonight. Uh, I'd heard that private schools can receive funds from towns. So I called St. Johnsbury Academy today and they, they assured me, yes, you, they can. So private schools can receive funds from towns as long as they are a school choice community. And so, so now the question will come into what does, so what happens is St. Johnsbury, they just send, a, or St. Johnsbury Academy just sends a bill for the education that they're giving to the town and the town pays it. Yes. Well, we have, we're not there yet, but I think that that when we cross it, we'll cross that bridge when it happens. I don't think on the town level. I think on a state level because the towns want to be able to save some money, and if they can spend five thousand dollars here and rather than fifteen thousand dollars in Spalding, I think that they, they they're willing to do that. Uh, so far, in my experience with public education, as long as you are respectful to them, uh, they basically have, they got so much on their plate, they, as long as your system's working, they're okay. And until someone complains, usually they're okay with whatever you're doing. I'll be honest with you. The DCF, I'm just being honest, DCF is so overwhelmed, we're still going to go to training number one. We haven't even gone to training number one yet. Okay. <laughs> Because they're just like, you know what, you, you're, you're doing okay, we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> just, just do it, that kind of concept, okay? I, when I was in public education for six or seven years, I, did, I never told them I was using the Bible. I never gave them verses. I just was using it. I was using the, the very principles I'm teaching for Proverbs. I was using them with the kids that they were giving me that were in special ed, and it was working. And they were just like, just do whatever you're doing. Don't want to even know. <laughs> they're overwhelmed. And I know that there is that concept in fear. I understand it. But we are finding that that has turned in the last 10 or 15 years when particularly uh, President Bush, W. Bush, opened up faith-based charities uh, that could receive certain funds. The state of Missouri just won a Supreme Court battle. Uh, the Luth a Lutheran school out there received federal funds to build a, a playground. 
It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court backed the Lutheran school. We know that Ohio has uh, ed, ed choice, Florida has ed choice, Nebraska has ed choice. See, what's happening is that there's a movement that's shifting and saying, our system isn't working. We're pouring millions of dollars into a system that isn't working. We need assistance, we need help. And as long as there are charter schools, private schools, and now they're starting to even look to education, religious education schools like ours, to say, if you can help us, <laughs> We're okay with that right now. We're not here to make a big stink over all the things. So those are things that we can, we can look into as we get there. Um, but I think, I think it's God opening up huge opportunities. And uh, we ought to, to at least examine it very clearly and closely. I think the big thing is that we have to set up a system here in which we have a fee per class that if they participate, we need to... Uh, there needs to be a separation between the idea that they're not coming here to get a Bible education because that will create red flares all over the place. But I think we can approach the parents and say they can write a waiver if they, or they can pay for it. The town is just going to pay for the core of the education, not paying for the religious part, like Bible class, you know. So that's the idea behind that. But I know there will be people that disagree. I know. But I look at it. We, we have an open enrollment. We're looking at evangelizing as many as we can, and uh, this is something that I think is a possibility, and I think worth looking at. So let's keep that in prayer as we, we go forth and make sure we're making good, wise decisions, okay? All right, so that's all that I have on that side of things. If you would keep uh, Bonnie Stern in prayer.